So, um, morning everybody. Um, it's Sunday morning. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks for organising on Sunday. It's a great pleasure to be here, but just one piece of advice. Always work out who your audience is before you agree to give a talk. And, uh, and then you should vary it depending on who's in the audience. And I haven't. So to those, <laughs> to those of you I'm looking at now, if you want to leave, I won't feel upset. So I think it's really important to... Um, appreciate where somebody comes from in, the, in order to understand their buses and about what they're going to say. Um, so a little bit of pot in history. So this is me. This is... I think you can spot which is me. Um, so I, I, was, I was born in... I'm a child of the 60s, let's just leave it at that. Born in Singapore um, in the early 1960s. Um, and they lived as a, as a iterant childhood, uh, came to this country as a, as a teenager. Um, and and this, was, this was the Singapore that I knew in the early 1960s. Sorry, the pointer's not coming up on the slide. Again, this is Oxford, you won't confuse it. That's Singapore. <laughs> and that, that boat half, that you see halfway on, on your left-hand side, that's now the headquarters of HSBC. Next door to that is headquarters of the Standard Charter. That is the same business district of Singapore in one generation. So that is ancient history, but it ain't that much ancient history. And, and how a, a country can change if certain things are put in place. And Singapore is a very unique place in many ways, both good and bad. But the, the development in one individual's lifetime has been truly staggering. And if you lay on top of that, the, the, the developments and change in the scientific endeavor in that lifetime, it is truly staggering. And the only thing I would predict, and I'll come back repeatedly in the talk, is that in the generation that those in the room will be taking forward, it will change even faster than it has done in, in my lifetime. So um, came to the UK as a teenager, um, uh, having been in some slightly dodgy places, which makes going into the United States now a challenge, especially with a name like Farrow, which occasionally has an H put on the end of it. And, and leads to a lot of time wasted in US airports. Um, studied medicine uh, in London um, and in Edinburgh and in San Francisco. Um, came to Oxford as part of a, a, a PhD uh, and trained as a neurologist. Um, and apologies for what I'm about to say to any neurologists in the audience, but in 1995, at the Association of British Neurologists, I was giving a talk not dissimilar to this, and at about this point of the talk, I looked up at the audience and thought, I can't stand the thought of working with you neurologists for the rest of my life. <laughs> neurology, neurology has changed. Um, uh, but in 1995, it was an interesting specialty. Um, and, and so one of the greatest uh, pieces of luck is coming back from Norwich and having that memory. The next day, I happened to have a, a drink with somebody in where I was finishing off my PhD in the Institute of Medical Medicine, now the Weatherall Institute of Medical Medicine here in Oxford. And by chance, somebody said they're looking for somebody to take over the running of a very nascent small unit in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam and were quite wanting somebody who came from a, some sort of quasi-scientific background and, and in the end of 95 moved to Vietnam thinking, thinking I'd be going for two to three years. Um, and again, it's why it's crucial to never prejudge where you're going to go in life because you go for two or three years, but actually halfway through it, you decide that's slightly better than running a migraine clinic in, in Oxford or Edinburgh. And so I stayed for 18 not that there's anything wrong with migraine clinics, I, I stress. Um, and stayed until 2013 when I came back to London. This is where I worked. This is the Hospital for Tropical Diseases in the top picture. I think it's the world's largest infectious disease hospital dedicated to infectious diseases, about 600 to 1,000 beds in Ho Chi Minh City, built by the, that hospital was built by the South Koreans in 1973, prior, just prior to the end of the Vietnam War. Um, but actually, there had been a, a hospital on that site serving the Vietnamese population during the French colonial era. 
Um, and in the middle of it, uh, the Vietnamese government built for us, um, and this is Professor Hien, who really is, is one of the great mentors of my career, um, built this research uh, center within the grounds of the hospital and, and trying to replicate a little bit of the lessons I'd learned from the Institute of Molecular Medicine here, wanted um, to make sure that the research endeavor was integrated completely with the public health and the clinical endeavor. And, and, and one of my concerns of academia at the moment is the fact that we're separating those two and the number of individuals, critically, and teams that can bridge those gaps, I think are getting less in a way that I don't think ultimately will be to the benefit of patients. And, and so um, we wanted to build it absolutely 20 meters or so from, from the clinical and public health uh, facility. And this was, I'm, I'm very much the clinical end of clinical science, and this would be the a typical ward round in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, uh, over the period of the 20, almost 20, 18 years that I was in Vietnam, and of course things changed a bit, and as I'll talk, non-communicable diseases and chronic conditions became much more important in Vietnam as it went through its uh, demographic and economic development, um, but never, and HIV came. Um, but nevertheless, these remain uh, critically important today. And then for reasons that I do sometimes, in fact, almost daily ask myself is, is why I, I gave up this view from my office to a daily commute <laughs> from Oxford to London on a daily basis uh, down the Great Western Railway, which is, certainly goes to the West and is a railway, but any other connection with those three words <laughs> is tenuous. <laughs> to become head of the Wellcome Trust, um, uh, which is the world's second largest, um, but in close partnership with our good colleagues uh, at the Gates Foundation who are here. Um, and the reason I came back um, was because I felt that um, uh, Welcome, um, as, a, as an original American, we should thank all Americans for giving us Henry Welcome. Uh, it's what you get if you get, give somebody a knighthood. They come to your country and they give you lots of money. Uh, so Henry Welcome was an American, and we could never forget that because we are in the UK as an accident of history. And as we keep saying to the UK government, we are here in the UK as an accident of history. We don't have to be here in the UK, um, which is a very important message to be able to send. But although the welcome 80 years old had a fantastic history, and, and, uh, and I think um, uh, uh, on a remarkable uh, trajectory, uh, the reason I came back was twofold. One is I, I was not aware of so many organizations that emotionally and by what they did brought together the three things that I think ultimately matter if you're going to make uh, the world a better place and move humanity on. That is coming together of science, innovation, and putting science and innovation in the context of society. Those, to me, are the three bits that if you don't get right, if you do only address one or two of them without the third, whichever of the three, then I think you'll struggle to, to bring the greatest benefits to the greatest number of, of people. And Welcome did that, and it always has done that, going back to Henry's time, and I felt it, it could do more. And secondly, well, it was a great institution, I felt, um, uh, and this is sometimes inevitable when something gets big, that it, it almost become frightened of its shadow. It had almost become concerned about what it did as it became uh, part of the establishment. And I think, and we could talk about what is, the re what is the responsibility of academia? What is the responsibility of a funder? What is the responsibility of an independent funder? What is the responsibility of an independent funder that is not constrained inevitably by the democratic system and that is both positive and negative. But I think it puts a responsibility onto that organization to do things and see the world in a different way because replicating what governments do, I don't think is the role of foundations. And, and that is a big topic of conversation at the moment. We're very happy to come back to. Going to move on to global health now. And if I could just show this, many of you will have seen this before, but it never fails to amaze me. And, and that is, whilst we, hold on a sec, whilst we, um, are going through an era when there's great uncertainty uh, politically. Um, there is a sense uh, abroad of, of, of a degree of cynicism that the world is as it is and always will be. I think it's really important just to step back and say, actually, we've made phenomenal progress. And we have not made phenomenal progress by standing and watching. We've made phenomenal progress because of the decisions we make. We are not passive observers of history. What we decide to do changes the course of history. So if you could just play this through, and it is, you've seen it before, it comes from uh, Hans Rosling, the brilliant epidemiologist, goes through the years, this is income 
and this is life expectancy. And as you can see, most countries, each blob is a country. Yellow is uh, Europe and, and red is Asia. Blue is Africa and the greens are the Americas. As wealth increases on the whole, uh, health increases. Those are intimately linked. And occasionally, remarkable things happen as now, which is staggering change in life expectancy across the world. And of course, um, undergraduates would say that's the First World War. And of course, everybody in this room would, would say that was the influenza pandemic of 1918, 100 years ago today. And you can see how the, the relatively homogeneous world has split out now into, into a very diverse set of countries. Uh, we can argue why that's occurred, uh, but life expectancy is now uh, 80 or so, 80 plus in some countries, Japan and others, and remains uh, at the 50 level or 60 level in many countries of the world. We, we have to address this. Can I go back to the slides now? So amongst the, the cynicism and the concerns about the way the political process is in many countries, and it's uh, true in this country as well, our take is I think it is really important to step back and say what progress we have made. And one particular area I'll just pick out, but we could choose others, is since the turn of the century, since about 1988, 1998 through until about 2015, 700 million people in the world had, did not have malaria as a result of things that were done. 700 million people up until about 2014 from the turn of the century. And about three and a half million people are alive because of changes that were made and did not die, mostly women and young children in sub-Saharan Africa. A huge success story. And that is not by chance. And I think overall, during this period when we really brought together science, innovation, and society, and we were able to change the world, I think the scientific and academic community on the whole just thought that was, that was now going to be accepted by the world, that the enlightenment was true, and that what we did would be uh, correlated, associated, and, and in the public's eye, uh, the cause of that improvement. And I'll come back to that. So the change in malaria came about because of the coming of bed nets, the coming of artemisinin combination therapy uh, out of left field uh, from a Chinese herbal drug invented 2,000 years ago uh, to treat hemorrhoids and fever, uh, found to be the most important antimalarial drug ever, ever discovered, uh, not through traditional ways and traditional roots of science, but really through a chance finding. And critically, because that knowledge was then translated through remarkable communication strategy, through society being brought together with it, and critically through complex, difficult, but leadership of being forced through. Now, I would argue that lesson was critically important in taking science through to making the world a better place. It took us far, far too long. We had the evidence on which to move on malaria really in the late part of the last century, and we didn't really bring it to bear until 10 years later. And we've got to get better, as in true with HIV and antiretroviral drugs in, in many parts of the world. We've got to learn how to bring that faster that innovation faster to bring real, true public health benefit. But when we do do it, it has a dramatic uh, impact. But as I alluded to at the start, with my experience from Singapore, then coming through this country as a teenager, the world is changing. And I, again, and during the, the mentor session I had earlier, I, uh, I, it's really important, I think, especially when one is at the start of the career, to not think how the world is today and think that is how it's going to be through one's career. It, it, it isn't. The world is changing, and it's much more important to think where the world is going and how you are going to drive that than to think, what can I change in the world today? Because it's where the world is going, and you are the drivers of it. So this is um, uh, Ebola. This is the Ebola River in 1976. And the first outbreak, which Peter Piot was very involved in the discovery of the Ebola outbreak in 1976. There have subsequently been about 30 outbreaks. But in the Ebola outbreak of 1976, it occurred in a rural community who had a, who had a degree of um, respect, might be the right word, but also they were relatively passive in the sense that they were told to stay where they are and not move. There were about uh, less than 1,000 people living in that village at the time, and it was possible to corral the village and prevent that epidemic spreading anywhere else, and a couple of hundred people lost their lives from the village. If you had Ebola in 1976, you came across somewhere between seven and nine other people during your period of infectivity. Fast forward to 2014, to the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, and this was now happening in an urban setting. 
The virus had not changed, so everybody beavering away to work out those sequence variations in the virus actually had not changed. The host genetics, of course, had not changed. The backbone of immunity in the population had not changed. What changed was society. And in 2014, in Freetown, or in Monrovia, the number of individuals that you came across when you were infectious with Ebola was not seven to nine, it was over 200. And so your public health response has to be completely different. You have to appreciate what drives trust in this community and what drives trust in this community, and that may be very, very different. You have to appreciate that the communication channels are very different. Who listens to what? To what? It's very different. And where people get information is very different. But in order to have the impact of an epidemic, uh, to bring it to an end, you have to understand that context. Otherwise, you'll never be able to do it, uh, bring the epidemic to a close. And of course, the world has changed in terms of travel and communication. So when I first came to the UK in the early 1970s, I came by boat. I mean, it's almost unthinkable to, to my, certainly my children's generation, but also anybody in this room, that you would get on a boat in New Zealand at that time and come to, to, to the UK. It took seven, seven weeks to come. And of course, there will be people in this room now who will be taking whatever you've got harboring in your lungs or wherever else, and usually at this point somebody coughs, which just makes the point, but <laughs> you will take this. And the biggest, um, the, 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 the most dynamically changing communications, trade and travel, at the moment that's going on from a low base, but will become a high base, is this link between Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. And that will drive, my world of infectious diseases, that will drive a whole series of new opportunities and challenges. There has never been, for instance, yellow fever in Southeast Asia, but the, the thought of a yellow fever outbreak in Jakarta, Ho Chi Minh, uh, Beijing would be truly uh, horrific. And global health is changing. So David used to look like the figure on your left, and increasingly, <laughs> David looks like the figure on, on, just to the side. That is true globally. That is true everywhere. And that has profound implications for the whole structure of how we think about health, well-being, and how we deliver public and clinical health. But it's changing in all sorts of other ways. Um, as, as the uh, life expectancy, of course, increases, then the, then the disease spectrum increases. And as a caricature, which can be shot down, but as a caricature, largely in the so-called rich world, the, the burden of infectious diseases did diminish as those more chronic and, and non-communicable diseases rose. And so a health system had the capacity to adapt and evolve to meet that new challenge. One of the great challenges of low and middle income countries is that they continue to have that double whammy. And the health system and structure and governance one requires to deal with the acute of an infectious disease, often malaria, uh, and the chronic of the non-communicable, Unless we solve this issue, how to structure health systems and fund them and govern them in the context of that changing demographic, again, I don't think we'll deliver the maximum benefits to the maximum number of people. And then the challenges that we face, and, and, and you will face, that my generation has, has nicely given to you, um, there is a coming of a challenge to the complacency of the academic community that as long as one provided evidence, the world would thank us uh, honor us and do it. And that is increasingly challenged. So the anti-vaccine movement is a very good example of that. Uh, it's, it's not all pervasive, but it's almost becoming all pervasive and it's focused around vaccines. But I, but I don't think any of us should think it's going to stay at vaccines. There will be challenges to, to knowledge. Uh, in the wonderful Brexit debate in this country, there was a question of who needs experts. Um, it is happening around the world. People have greater access to a greater variety of news. And I think on the whole, the academic community has not uh, realized quite soon enough that their authority, for want of a better word, the trust that society has in them is going to be challenged more than it has in the past. And I think we have to wake up to that. The world is also changing. And I, I, I would argue that climate change is going to have an absolutely huge impact on health. I would argue that actually the climate change community on the whole has, has made an incredibly strong scientific argument for why climate change is so important. But I would argue that they've put it too much in the context of what might even happen to your grandchildren, let alone mine. And I think there's a critical need to bring it back to what is happening to people today, because ultimately it's very difficult to change behavior when you're thinking about an impact in 50 or 100 years time. 
I think we have to reconnect with people's lives today and the impact of, of climate change that's, that's going on. And inequality, we cannot escape the increasingly divided within country and between country uh, opportunities that exist. And, and again, I think uh, many of us would argue that was ultimately the driver of the um, political turmoil of, of the last five years, not just in the, the so-called rich world, but in many other parts of the world as well. And finally, I think the concept that came out of the end of the Second World War and the setting up of the United Nations, the World Bank, the IMF, and indeed the WHO, is all based on the concept of a nation state. And increasingly, a nation state is a difficult thing to define, not just in areas of conflict, but, but the, the concept of a benevolent nation state doing the right things for the maximum number of people in its country is also being eroded and questioned. And, and therefore, whilst I have been both a great critic of some of the, those agencies, I also we need to think what we would be if we did not have those agencies. And I think in an increasingly nationalistic world, it makes the case for those global bodies where the whole world is represented uh, ever more important. So for me, this is the new global public health. We, we have a world where increasingly we will be needing to create structures and systems uh, that apply for this double whammy of the infectious disease burden and the continued and increasing non-communicable burden we still have and have not uh, got rid of the, the great endemic diseases, TB, malaria in particular, HIV has made great progress. Uh, and of course, drug resistance uh, is a huge problem for the whole of modern uh, medicine. But ultimately, this is both a health issue and critically an economic and governance and political issue. And I don't, don't think the academic community can stand on the sidelines and think we are or we're apolitical. There is, in my view, no such thing as being apolitical. And, and this, the community has got to appreciate they need a voice in that political debate if it's going to make sure that the evidence comes through to us as quickly as possible. And, and finally, just without thinking about it, these are uh, epidemics that are going on today, the 10th of February, somewhere uh, around the world. Um, and whilst epidemic diseases uh, have sometimes been exaggerated in terms of their impact, nobody should underestimate when you have an epidemic, you're in the middle of it, what it does to the society in which it's in. And again, the way it builds a, a, a huge degree of mistrust and also puts the whole of the other parts of the health system uh, under threat. And this is the reality of what it is like to work in these environments. And there'll be many in this room that have worked in these environments. This was, uh, this was New Year in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And this is universal health care. This picture on, on the top right for you is one of the best clinics uh, in Eastern DRC uh, at, at the moment. Um, healthcare involves many things, but in the uh, outbreak of 2014, 2015 Ebola, uh, the communities of Sierra Leone uh, traditionally and culturally wanted to bury their dead in white body bags. All the body bags sent from Europe in the first uh, nine months of that epidemic were black. And it was therefore no surprise when you said to communities, come into treatment centers, we haven't actually got any treatment for you, but if you do die, we'll, we'll bury you nicely in a black body bag. It was no surprise that actually the community didn't really like that. And as a result, the epidemic went on far longer than it, than it needed to. And uh, this is the environment now. It goes back to my comment about nation states and unstable and fragile states and indeed conflict. And how do we in the future um, bring public health to its maximum benefit when you're working in both fragile and increasingly conflicted states. So to go in Eastern DRC at the moment, you have to wear uh, UN hats, you have to be prepared to be, be shot at. Uh, this is evacuation of a, of a young guy that was beaten up because he was delivering vaccines in a village in DRC and left for dead and we had to evacuate him. But in order to evacuate him, uh, you had to have a rear gunner. This was uh, run by somebody called Serge from Kiev in Ukraine. Um, and you really felt safe in the Ukrainian helicopter as it came down, as it came down over this sort of environment. Um, and, and, and we have not thought through how, whether it be um, uh, universal health coverage or the ability to respond to epidemics or to, to look after people with chronic and long-term conditions, how are we going to do that when there is, in some places, either societal pushback against it or governmental pushback against it, or in this case, conflict going on. 
And how do you deal with that? How would you deal uh, with a cholera epidemic in Yemen or a MERS outbreak in, in Syria at the moment? Very difficult to appreciate. And those communities from the MSF world, the research world, uh, the security world live in different silos and actually mostly don't speak each other's languages and don't understand the nature of what each other are trying to do. So I think my health depends on your careers. Um, and, and I think the future is to not see uh, the siloization that I think we as funders have contributed into making of academia. And the ability for the future to see those really exciting interfaces. When I was working for a guy called Charles Warlow in Edinburgh in neurology, one of the great, the only thing really I learned in neurology um, was, the, was that importance of the excitement of trying to identify a new interface, which some, not, nobody yet perhaps had explored um, between one area of science or medicine and another area. And I think when you can start to see those interfaces and you have the humility to work across boundaries, then increasingly that will be the critical place uh, to work in, and I think it'll be the critical place uh, where real innovation and excitement scientifically uh, comes from. And my worry for academia is not that we don't bring very bright, uh, mostly young people into it, but then when we bring it into it, we force them into short-termism and into siloization, which means that they don't have the ability to see what the importance of trust communication, anthropology, social sciences to their work on an Ebola outbreak or their work on genetics or host susceptibility or whatever it else is. And I think the true interface will be knowledge and expertise, but the humility to cross boundaries and to try and identify those early, as early as possible in one's career and then have the confidence to go for it, I think is where the future will lie. And so whatever that is, environment, demographics, nutrition, genetics, governance, politics, uh, to appreciate the world of what it will be, not of what it is today. And to appreciate that the decisions you make are not going to be passive, they will influence the trajectory of the next 30 to 40 years. And I'll finish there and just wish you good luck with that. Thank you, Professor Farr. Uh, we have time for questions. We can get some mics. Hi, um, Abhi Mishra, I'm a senior scholar and currently at the University of Chicago. And I was wondering, um, in, in terms of funding academics, there is a challenge between funding research versus funding local state capacity that governments have to be able to implement programs. And, and in your experience of trying to balance those two things between you know, supporting st state capacity building of governments to implement programs versus doing research. Uh, how do you sort of balance that out and how do you incentivize academics to make sure that they contribute to state capacity building? Yeah, it's a really critical question and very difficult. And I, I think the first thing I'd say is that there is no single answer to that question. And, and unfortunately, and I can't take the academic out of me, it, the answer is it depends. Um, I think it depends on who you are, what you're trying to achieve, and also who your partner and counterpart is on, on, on government side. Uh, and that is true whether you're working here in the UK with the British government, uh, whether you work in the United States with the US government, uh, or indeed in Vietnam or Sierra Leone or, or wherever else. I think you can um, meet a compromise there because ultimately, as things stand at the moment, without, without the enhancement of the nation states to, 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 to deliver, then anything one does in research is going to be limited. On the other hand, um, there are a number of countries, and, and all countries suffer from this. The, the, the constraints around what it can do um, don't allow the excitement of the research to take it forward necessarily always as it should do. I, I think you can strike balances and compromises there, but, but that's really why I made the point about being political. You, you, there is no such thing in this space of, of apolitical. Um, and by that, I mean both the politics of, of politics, but also the political of society. Uh, and I think we have perhaps um, been guilty of, of thinking it was a given that evidence would come into sensible policymaking 
uh, that society would accept it relatively passively and would respond. And I think increasingly we have to realize that may not be true. And, and again, I think um, that means that, that whatever it is, look at how we're using data or genetics uh, or, the, or social media, all of those have a societal and political element. And I think if we're just doing research in those spheres without bringing in with humility that, that, that social and anthropological work, then we will miss the opportunity. Yeah. Is it working? Hi, Carl Marcy, a senior scholar from Boston, uh, academic and entrepreneur. You, uh, thank you, by the way, for coming on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Love uh, it. You, you mentioned silos in academia, which by definition mean people get in their own bubbles and, and don't communicate very much. I'm wondering if you can comment about, I think, another challenge for academics, which is translation. How do you go from, from an a, a institution that values uh, peer-reviewed papers over all else, but not at practical applications at, at the bedside. I wonder if you could comment on that. Mm. Well, you're much better placed in truth to comment on that than I am, um, but I'll have a go. Um, I think we all have to appreciate um, and be self-critical of what we're good at. Um, and, and I think on, on, at some edges, we've, we've fudged and, and blurred that margin. Um, uh, it's not true that all academics cannot translate. It's not true that all academics can't see where their work is going uh, into translation innovation and ultimately something that changes somebody's lives. But we also have to appreciate that is a, it's not a linear process, it's a, it's a circular process. And, and somebody's got different roles to play at different times. And actually the skill sets one requires at different times are different. And probably personalities are different. And, and so whilst I, I, I hugely value those innovative ideas, I wish actually academia would do more of that rather than the short-termism, particularly with somebody like Welcome, of short-term grants where you're just on a two to three or four year cycle. Uh, and I wish we could liberate people from that. But I think academics also need to know and be advised by their institutions when it is best to hand things over to others that would allow them to group. And I don't think certainly this country does that as well as, as the best places in the US. Um, I think other places in, in Europe do it well as well. I think uh, Stockholm has, uh, and, and we've been, I think, too slow here. Um, I think universities in this country on the whole have seen the, the apparent value in things uh, as being massively exaggerated. Um, and we also have a problem, as you know very well, in, in, in the, fi the financing of that. Uh, segment. Um, and I think, again, when it comes back to, to welcome, I think given that, in theory, we should be here forever, whatever that means, um, we have a role to play in, in liberating and providing patient capital uh, to get people out of the short-term cycle of both grants and the venture world. Um, that's not a very specific answer, but, but I, I think this, this country in particular does have to look at that innovation pathway, realize what best practice looks like, learn from others, and then, and then invent a new model, because I, I don't think it's worked as well as it could and should. Yeah, the back. Good morning. Uh, first, I wanted to congratulate you on standing in front of a global health audience and referring to any list of countries as dodge guts. guts. Trend is what? You've got guts for uh, calling any list of countries dodgy at a global, mental health, a global health conference, sorry. But the delegation from Yemen and Libya want to have a word afterwards. Um, my question is... I did say the U.S. was a bit dodgy as well. Thank you. Thank you. I'm representing... And I won't comment on the U.K. Uh, my question for you is really for you to inspire the scholars who are here to explain to them the value is spending a lot of time preparing large grant applications and failing. Because that is something that I hear from a lot of academics, yeah. which is soul-destroying. But I know that you know the purpose, and I wonder if you could share it with everyone. Yeah, um, and, and then, it, then it comes to, um, we would dearly love um, to, get, to get ideas on this as well. I mean, it, it, it then gets a little bit like democracy. You, you, you realize all its limitations, um, and, and Brexit certainly teaches you the limitations of democracy, uh, uh, but then you try and invent a different system, and, and where do you go? And, and the, one of the challenges we've got is, is that we've, over the last 20 or 30 years, we've created a huge... Um, industry called academia, but, but we have never had the resources to truly fund it properly. 
Um, and therefore, you, you are in a, a constant cycle of, of limited resources with, with too many people chasing it. And, and you know, off the top of my head, I think R01 grants at the moment have a, have a sort of 6 or 7% success rate. Uh, we are luckier in Welcome. It's still about 22 to 24 percent uh, success rate. Uh, uh, we would dearly love to have mechanisms which increase that, uh, but we're dealing with a, a huge demand uh, which we, on our own, can't can't meet. Um, I do think, in this case, and it's a sort of this room um, exemplifies it and could do more. I, I do think um, there is there's a huge role to play in sponsorship and mentorship. Um, uh, in terms of helping people through that, uh, how, to, how to get grants. You, you cannot ignore the fact that it is a game to some degree, and learning how to play that is important. Um, but also to, to, to have a thick skin. There is nobody in this room uh, coming towards the middle or the end of their careers that didn't get many, many, many rejections, and still, still are. Um, I think you do a little bit have to take the attitude that, that it's their mistake, not mine, and to keep going. Um, and I think the university sector, under pressure financially, has got to work with us and others to try and do more um, to support those early career researchers who actually are going to be where the next generation of ideas are. We all know that. But how do you get onto the ladder in the first place is the biggest challenge. We, d we don't have an answer. We don't have an answer for it. Um, so I... Uh, Anne McKenna from the Africa Oxford Initiative, and I am a big proponent of interdisciplinary research. All we do uh, at AFOX is bringing people from across the pond to talk to each other and develop programs together. But increasingly, I'm getting anxious about places where you don't have depth of expertise and needing to actually build those in first before you push very early career researchers to go into all these um, things that they really are not, for lack of a better word, really in-depth experts on and because all the research funding is moving towards interdisciplinary research, we're moving them all into interdisciplinary research without really building capacities in in-depth analysis of your own place. And I think the best forms of interdisciplinary research is where the best in biostatistics comes with the best in genomics and they do something together. So where is the place still for that in-depth expertise to be earned before or along with the interdisciplinary work? So I, I completely agree with you, and, and whenever something becomes so much part of everybody's vocabulary, you should always question it. And, and what you're, the worst outcome, in my mind, would be to drive interdisciplinarity at such a shallow level that it never actually was able to address questions. I think the key word is humility. I think the key word is to have the ability and expertise in a space, but to realize that that space is only part of the, the answer. And that in order to provide and help your space, it, the critical is to reach across a discipline into other spaces. It, it is not to be shallow, it is to be deep, but it's to have humility with that depth such that you reach out across. Otherwise, we run the risk of having uh, inter- or multidisciplinarity, which is so shallow it, it can't actually address problems just as you, you described. I do think, again, academia, funders, universities have got a critical role to play in that, because there is almost no better environment than a university to, to allow that to happen, because the universities are, on the whole, uh, collections of multidisciplinary organizations. That is the time, as either an undergraduate or graduate, to learn the language and the, and the culture of those different specialties, whilst going deep into your own. And, and again, I think university systems, and Oxford's very privilege because it has the college system and everything else which actually facilitates and encourages that so so you become I think in this environment you're in very privileged position to be less uh, uh, siloed than you are in, in in some other environments that I know that, that, thank you very much uh, for your talk I, I have a question for you relating to my background from Africa as we speak the African Union is having a conference in Addis Ababa discussing how 35 of the 55 African countries will make a commitment to spend at least $86 uh, per capita on healthcare expenditure, which will change the landscape in terms of financing of healthcare. Um, from your perspective, uh, since you are part of a major funder, how will you start to work with governments that are more determined uh, to take on the responsibility of research and find your own way as an external funder within an African continent that wants to take on the responsibility of funding itself? 
So I think this is a a great question, and it's a it's a it's it's a perfect time to ask the question. I, I think the changes that are coming, some of which are being discussed today in in Addis, as you describe, around some other things as well, like like uh, the, the open skies uh, changes uh, and visa free travel. I think those are also hugely part of it. One of the things I suppose I would be proud of that in the last five years at, at Welcome, along with uh, great partners at the Gates Foundation and, and others, has been to shift this, this now famous phrase of shift to the center of gravity. Um, so six years ago, seven years ago, we as a funder uh, would have um, made those grants, awards, uh, institutional, or whatever it was, from decisions and an agenda set in London or you know, Geneva or Washington or, 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 or Seattle. Um, that has completely shifted now, and, and so the fund, our funding for that now is through the African Academy of Sciences, uh, just the agendas, the questions, the review processes, the grant mechanisms, the financing and accountability is all done now through the African Academy of Sciences. And my hope is, including through the African Union to which they're linked with, that ultimately that would be a catalyst by which that whole transition uh, could occur. Uh, and in the end, that can't occur with um, external money, uh, even if it's shifted the center of gravity. It has to come uh, with, with, with national and or uh, regional money. Um, and, but I, Chris might want to comment on this as well. I think the transition in the last three or four years to that has been nothing short of, of staggering in terms of that shift in the center of gravity. And we would dearly love to see that go further. Um, we have a similar program actually for us and also the Gates Foundation in India, which is doing exactly the same thing. Uh, that's with the Indian government. And just this year, I think now announced, we'll be moving from a one-to-one -one funding ratio to a one-to-two funding ratio. And in future, I suspect that will go to a one-five or one-to-ten. Um, and, and we won't be involved in setting that agenda. To me, that would be success. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Jamila, and I'm a senior scholar as well, um, and lead an international HIV advocacy organization. And you spoke quite compellingly about how evidence itself doesn't necessarily achieve the change that we want to see in our societies, and that none of it is apolitical. Um, I just wonder how you at the Wellcome Trust are thinking about the role of advocacy um, in peering that alongside some of the exciting work that you fund in science and in research, right, um, to make sure that we can achieve change in society. Yeah, so uh, I sort of alluded to it without being very specific a, a little bit about where I, um, th this sort of phrase of being a little bit frightened of one's shadow. Um, it's, it's a very sort of, um, I think, well, I, I would argue it's misguided. I, I think advocacy um, is not always a, uh, is, is a difficult word to understand, but ultimately it comes down to communication and ensuring that your values are A, transparent and open, and, and also that you make the case for that internally within your organization, but more importantly, ex externally. And I think on the whole, uh, welcome was too quiet in arguing for those, those, those values. There is an important question that comes with that, who you're accountable to. Um, you know, you are an independent foundation, you're not governed by the usual structures of democracy and, and others, and that is a really important question, to which there is a number of books being written at the moment. Uh, Robert Rice's book is very good on accountability. Um, but I think one can deal with the issue of accountability by being clear what you're trying to achieve, what you're not doing, what you are doing, being transparent about your decision-making processes and governance, and being as uh, totally transparent as you can uh, so that everybody knows what you're doing. But then I think you have a responsibility to use that voice. Uh, because with the, with, with the position that we and academia is in, um, I think the, that's an incredible privileged position to be in. And I think it comes with a very big responsibility, therefore, to use that privilege uh, to, do, to, to make the case for the things you believe in and be willing to be criticized when people don't agree with you. But what I don't think you can do is just hide behind the, the opaqueness of, of, of fear of, of stepping up and, and making the case. Okay, I think we'll end the session there. Thank you for uh, your questions and um, join me in thanking Professor Farrell. <laughs>